Thank you for volunteering at Laboratory Presbyterian Church. We truly appreciate your time and talent, and thank you for caring about our youth. This presentation will outline our church's plan to create a safe sanctuary. You will take a quiz following the presentation that has some rather specific questions to ensure that you've given the presentation proper attention and that you fully understand our church's protection policy. So it's recommended that you print and complete the notes page during the presentation as the quiz questions will come directly from the notes. On the back of the notes page, you can jot down any questions you have so that you can contact me to answer them. Let's start by opening with prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to work together to further your kingdom. Guide us as we show your love to children, youth, and vulnerable adults. Protect them as we help them learn more about you. We ask your blessing on the ministry and on not only those who are serving, but also those who serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Our purpose for safe sanctuaries is deeply rooted in scripture. The Bible calls us to care for those who can't care for themselves. In Mark chapter 9, verses 36 to 37, Jesus says, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. Additionally, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 5, If you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. The statistics surrounding abuse are absolutely shocking. There are 3 million reported cases of abuse every year, and that's just the reported ones. You can imagine how many more go unreported. 3 million a year means that there is over 8,000 a day, over 300 an hour, over 8 a minute. There is one instance of reported abuse that happens every 15 seconds. By the age of 18, one in three girls and one in every seven boys is sexually abused. I mean, the statistics are shocking and disgusting. And unfortunately, churches are a high-risk place for abuse to occur. This is because churches are trusting organizations, and sometimes churches will use volunteers by default, um, kind of like an any warm body will do type situation. Um, also, church programs are oriented in relationships. Abusers know this, and they will seek to volunteer in churches so that they can start the process of grooming and then abusing. And that's why child protection policies need to exist. We need to honor our baptismal covenant. We said yes when we were asked, do you as members of the Church of Jesus Christ Promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed with love and prayer? Will you encourage them to know and follow Christ and be faithful members of their church? We need to honor that um, through this child protection policy. The 205th General Assembly, uh, which met in 1993, approved the sexual misconduct policy and its procedures, and the 219th General Assembly updated it in 2010. The policy states, sexual misconduct takes advantage of the vulnerability of persons who are less powerful to act for their own welfare, including children. It is antithetical to the gospel call to work as God's servant in the struggle to bring wholeness to a broken world. It violates the mandate to protect the vulnerable from harm. Um, as of 2011, the Book of Order required all councils to implement a sexual misconduct policy and the 222nd General Assembly, so that would have been in 2016, approved the Child, Youth, and Vulnerable Adult Protection Policy and Procedures. And as of 2017, the Book of Order required all councils to implement a Child and Youth Protection Policy. So this is Book of Order G3.0106. Child abuse prevention and ministry protection policies are essential for every congregation. They're not only for the safety of our children, but also for our volunteers and employed workers. 
LPC adopted our child protection policy on February 26, 2016. And it's gone through a number of revisions and it will continue to be revised. Um, the most recent revision was approved by session on June 29th, 2021. And this 10 page document is LPC's current best attempt to prevent abuse within the church and to get help for those who report abuse in other areas of their life. So you will be reading this policy in its entirety and signing that you understand it. And we're going to hit the highlights now and really dig deep on a few things to expand on them and clarify them. Page one of the document explains the purpose, which we've already gone over, and it also includes the basic definitions as used in the document. And page two details the screening process for staff. Um, page three details the screening process for volunteers, which I'm going to expand upon now. First is the six month rule. Strangers are not allowed to come volunteer and directly supervise children or youth. Um, sometimes we have friends of volunteers who want to get involved and we allow them to volunteer, but only with the lead supervisor. Uh, for example, um, Joe Schmo has been a church member and volunteer for 20 years. He's a respected member of the congregation and Joe has a friend who wants to help with VBS. If that friend has clearances with clean records, the pastor and discipleship committee may decide to let them volunteer. Um, however, they're gonna be monitored by a more seasoned volunteer to ensure safety. Lots of people can volunteer, but not everyone can be in a supervisory role. Second, I wanted to clarify this section about disqualifying offenses. Obviously, if the child abuse clearance does not show a clean record, then that individual is not going to be able to volunteer with children and youth. Um, but there may be some exceptions to the criminal record, depending on the offense and how long ago that offense occurred. These exceptions are determined by church leadership and confidential documentation about why an exception was made um, and any stipulations for volunteering would be kept on record. On page four of the policy, we have the two adult rule and the open door policy. Children and youth should be supervised by at least two unrelated and non-cohabitating adults. Often in VBS, siblings or married couples wanna to work together to lead a group or a station, and that's fine in the large context of VBS because of the sheer number of volunteers we have. There's always going to be another non-related adult that is also watching the kids. Um, but if a married couple wanted to be the youth group leaders, um, a supervisory third adult would also need to be present at those meetings. And on the flip side, um, our Sunday school classes can be very small and they may only have one teacher because of that. But in those cases, though, there's always another roamer um, who's going to ensure safety. Um, another way we ensure safety is the open door policy. A classroom door can only be closed if there's a view window in it, which all of our classrooms have, and we do not lock doors. Page four of the policy continues by defining abuse. I want to go over these definitions and things to look for if someone is being abused. Physical abuse is abuse in which the person deliberately and intentionally causes bodily harm to a child. Um, you might see in the child a hostile and aggressive behavior toward others, fearfulness of parents and other adults, um, destructive behavior towards self or others or property, um, or they might have burns, facial injuries, a pattern of repetitive bruises. Emotional abuse is abuse in which a person exposes a child to spoken or unspoken violence or emotional cruelty. Um, Kids who are emotionally abused exhibit severe depression or withdrawal, a severe lack of self-esteem. Um, they might go to extremes to seek parental approval. The next type is sexual abuse in which sexual contact between a child and adult or a child and a more powerful youth occurs. Um, examples, examples of things to look for would be a child who has unusual advanced sexual knowledge or behavior, promiscuous behavior, um, difficulty walking or sitting, um, bruise, bruises or bleeding in the vaginal or anal areas, um, 
And then the last type of uh, abuse mentioned here is neglect, which is abuse in which a person endangers a child's health, safety, or welfare through negligence. Um, children who are neglected will have failure to thrive. They might have a pattern of inappropriate dress for the climate. They might beg or steal food, have chronic hunger, um, untreated medical conditions, or poor hygiene. Um, another type of abuse that isn't really mentioned in our policy, but I, I did want to bring up in this training, is ritual or spiritual abuse. This is going to be abuse in which another type, like physical, sexual, psychological violations of a child are inflicted regularly, intentionally, and in a stylized way by a person who's responsible for the child's welfare. Um, kids experiencing this, um, particularly in the church, might have unusual nervousness or anxiety at being left at nursery or Sunday school class. They might be reluctant to participate in church activities after they were once very enthusiastically um, approaching them. They might have comments such as, I don't want to be left alone with so-and-so. Um, they might have a fear of ministers, priests, or others wearing robes or uniforms. Um, so those are things that we can look for specifically in the church and uh, make sure that we address that right away. If a child tells you about abuse they're experiencing, you need to report it. Um, take every allegation of abuse seriously. Do not justify, explain away, um, place blame or accuse the victim. Do not confront the accused abuser. Um, you want to report it immediately to the pastor, the CE chair, and or the clerk of session. And this person will help you to make a report to Child Protective Services according to mandatory reporting laws, and they'll notify the parents as required. Um, the person you report to will also coordinate the appropriate response if the abuse or neglect was alleged to have occurred at LPC. Do not speak to the media. Page five explains how teenage volunteers can be used in supervising children. Um, Pennsylvania does not require minors to have clearances when volunteering, but minors can get clearances and provide copies to the church. Um, teenage volunteers 14 or older are going to report to an adult and should be at least four years older than the kids they're supervising. Um, 12 and 13 year old volunteers are really just helpers. They are not directly supervising kids. Page five also explains how we protect guest children by using child check cards. Um, we know the kids whose parents are church members and those who attend regularly, but we want to be especially careful with our young children that we don't know the families as well um, to ensure that we don't give a child to someone who may have a custody issue. That's why we have a section on our VBS registration form that's for allergy medical custody issues, and it's also why we have the family's list who may pick up the child. Um, and we are not above asking for ID. We'd rather have a family be inconvenienced by going back to their car to get their driver's license instead of releasing a child to an adult that shouldn't have them. The next parts of the policy basically say to keep sick kids at home and that we will not provide medication. Um, obviously, there are exceptions to the medication rule. So if a child has a life-threatening condition and needs to have an EpiPen or insulin or something with them, leadership will have a written plan of action with the parents. And if a youth will be away from home for an extended time, such as um, a mission trip, then again, a written plan for medication will be worked out with leadership. What I really want to focus on is elaborating on page six for discipline and behavior guidelines. As a parent, we may use lots of different discipline strategies with our own kids that may or may not be appropriate for a church setting. And I want us to be clear on what LPC currently deems as acceptable and unacceptable discipline strategies. Um, in the quiz, you will see a list of strategies and be asked to sort them into the ones that can and cannot be used. So it would be helpful for you to write these on your notes page now. The discipline policy absolutely forbids any corporal punishment um, or embarrassment. Instead, we want to use fair, clear, and consistent expectations. 
the phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, really rings true here. Volunteers should make sure kids know what expectations are to be met and what the boundaries are. Carefully planned lessons and activities will decrease boredom and therefore decrease misbehavior. So have a plan and have a backup plan. Um, effective leaders have a bag of tricks in their back pocket of what to do if there's extra time that needs to be filled or the original plans can't be done due to poor weather or technology failure. You can praise kids for demonstrating the behaviors you want to see. Um, example might be, I like the way Susie is showing kindness by sharing her crayons or great job, Bobby, and cleaning up your area. I want to point out, though, that it's important to be respectful to neurodivergent kids when you're using praise. So saying, um, I like the way Susie is sitting quietly with her hands folded could be hurtful to Bobby, who has ADHD and can only pay attention when he's using a fidget or after taking a break to pace at the back of the room. So please respect that Susie and Bobby may listen and show understanding in different ways. Um, when asking kids knowledge questions, you could praise by saying, that was a thoughtful answer. That could be a good way to praise um, their understanding. Um, while you could say, you're on the right track, or I can see you're thinking, but those things could be used as ways to praise effort, even though it's not the right answer to a question. Sometimes kids won't want to answer questions or participate in certain activities, and that's okay. Avoid any kind of power struggle or ultimatum. You never say, if you don't participate in the recreation station, then you can't eat your snack. That's a completely unrelated consequence and is not respectful to the child's struggle. You could use first-then statements such as, first we have game time, then we go to snack, you could ask questions to find out why the child is struggling, such as, can you tell me about why you don't want to play the game? And you could use the child's answers to alleviate the struggle. Um, maybe they don't understand the rules, go over it. Maybe they um, don't didn't like that they were picked last. Uh, talk about their feelings with that. Um, or you could offer a choice. You could say, um, you can sit over there and watch the game instead of play, and you're welcome to join us if you choose. These are examples of respectful redirection. When a child doesn't follow a classroom expectation, you need to decide in the moment whether or not you need to intervene. Ask yourself, what is this behavior communicating? Is it getting in the way of the student's learning or the learning of others? And remember, as we discussed before, that some students may look off task when they're actually doing things that keep them on task. Autistic and ADHD kids may need movement to help them concentrate, so you'll have to find a way to respect their needs. If a child is displaying a behavior that needs to be direct, redirected, do it respectfully. Um, let's say Johnny is snipping his scissors carelessly um, and they're near another child's face. Um, since embarrassment and ridicule is prohibited, we would never say second graders don't act like that. That's not respectful redirection because it doesn't use neutral language or it doesn't describe what the student should do instead. The better response would be, I can tell you're having fun with the scissors. In our church, we use scissors carefully by keeping them close to us and pointed away from our bodies. This keeps us and others safe. Can you demonstrate that for me? Um, since the redirection was only for one student, I would want to speak quietly to that child. Uh, if several kids were exhibiting the same behavior, then I could address the issue with the whole class. And this kind of respectful redirection will usually eliminate the unwanted behavior. But let's say it doesn't. Um, we could instead say, I see you're having trouble using your materials safely. Would you like to move over here and cut out your project this way, or would you like me to cut it out for you? Again, that usually eliminates the unwanted behavior, but I'm sure you're wondering, what if it doesn't? <laughs> what if the kid gets mad and starts making threatening gestures with the scissors? Um, I would recommend at that point having someone get the program leader while you work on co-regulation. If a child is angry and acting out, the goal is to help them co-regulate, to regain their self-control. When kids are dysregulated, you want to use very few words. 
breathe through it with them, acknowledge their feelings. Um, if other kids are in danger, move them to a different area in the room or even to another room if it's an extremely dangerous situation. It's easier to move the kids who are in control of their emotions um, as trying to move a dysregulated child could cause a meltdown or explosive behavior. Um, don't tell a child who is dysregulated that they're going in timeout or that you're taking away their recreation time. Um, this imposition of punishments is not going to help. Traditional timeout is a punishment where kids sit alone to think about what they did and then they come back to the group. And current research shows this isn't effective. Um, Co-regulating could mean a break from the activity. Maybe the director takes the child for a walk to a different room, um, has the child help them with something, uh, gives them like a task to do basically to distract them, um, or maybe takes them to go get a drink. And then after the child is regulated, the director can ask questions about the issue and talk with the child so that they don't struggle again. Um, any behavior incident that escalates to this point will need to be documented on the injury incident report. There's one more discipline um, or behavior modification strategy that I want to advise against, and that is tangible rewards. Um, yes, this is something we have used in the past with Bible Bucks and similar incentive plans. However, tangible rewards can be upsetting to some kids, particularly neurodivergent ones, as they feel they're always being watched and they have to perform for adult approval and recognition. Research shows that it also decreases intrinsic motivation, which makes positive behavior choices less likely in the future um, unless the reward is constantly getting bigger. I know this slide covered a lot of information examples, but it's so important to follow these guidelines to create a safe and welcoming environment for all kids. Um, the bottom line is that LPC's child protection policy strictly prohibits corporal punishment and embarrassment, absolutely no spanking, hitting, or other physical discipline, and no embarrassing kids by making them stand in a corner, publicly correcting their behavior, or making them feel ashamed. Instead, our church leaders carefully plan activities and communicate fair, consistent, and clear expectations to the participants. Leaders use respectful redirection when needed. They avoid power struggles and timeouts and tangible rewards. And instead, they create a nurturing environment through praising kids and helping them to regain self-control when they're dysregulated. Um, also remember that as leaders, we can only help kids co-regulate when we are regulated ourselves. So if you feel triggered by a kid's behavior, it is okay to step back and let another adult co-regulate with that kid until you are better in control of your own emotions. Staff and volunteers are absolutely held to high standards and are expected to meet certain behavioral guidelines. Um, number one, obviously don't provide illegal or prohibited items to minors. Um, additionally, you should not be wearing jewelry or clothing that promotes those things. Don't promote alcohol, tobacco, violence, etc. Um, volunteers should not initiate touch with children. It is inappropriate to ask a child for a hug or to ask them to sit on your lap. Um, that said, we work with young kids and sometimes they want a hug from you. So if a child initiates appropriate physical contact, such as a hug, you can hug them back in that moment if you're comfortable. Um, if you are uncomfortable with it, you could simply say, I prefer not to be hugged. Um, if a child climbs into your lap, uh, say like during story time or something, it would be better for you to say, um, sit here, Johnny, and, and pat the spot right next to you. Um, you can sit close to me without being in my lap. So as leaders, we always need to keep in mind the child's needs, not our own. So if a kid hugs you goodbye, that's fine. But do not initiate it yourself or say, can I have a hug? Um, if you see inappropriate contact or relationships between minors and adults, you should say something. Uh, report this to the program leader. Additionally, you can report it to the pastor, clerk of session, or Christian ed chair. 
For restroom guidelines, this is one of the areas that is going to likely be revised in the future versions of the policy. Um, the current guidelines say to escort kids under five to the bathroom, be sure it is empty of adults, and then stand outside the bathroom while the child is inside. All of that is going to stay the same. Um, sometimes young children will need assistance with unfastening or fastening their outfit. And the current guidelines say to leave the door open and try to have another person present. It also says for diapering to try to have another person present. Um, my recommendation in revisions will be along the lines of Yoda. Uh, there is no try, only do. Um, anyway, may I have? voice ever is terrible, but the point is make sure you have another adult present if you are assisting someone in this vulnerable situation. It protects you as well as them. So my advice is to diaper in an open visible area such as the nursery changing table. Um, young children should have supervised independence. Let them ask for help while you stand in the hall um, with the restroom door open and the stall door closed. Give them complete privacy and make sure another adult is there if the child asks for help. The guidelines also say that kids over five who regularly attend LPC may be mature enough to use the restroom without an adult escort, and this can be allowed at later discretion. Um, my recommendation in this situation would be to have a buddy go with them. So if it's snack time and first grader Betty needs the restroom and knows where it is, maybe ask her first grade friend Vicky to go with her. Um, but if sixth grader Bobby needs the restroom, it's fine to just have him go, as typical middle schoolers do not need an escort. For accidental injuries, minor first aid can be given. Um, this would be things like band-aids, ice packs, or the magical wet paper towel. Um, serious medical treatment means contacting the parent and calling an ambulance if necessary. And after medical attention is given, whether it's minor or more serious, you wanna complete an instant report, which is conclude, it's included on pages eight and nine of the child protection policy. Um, this is what the injury and incident report looks like. It should be filled out for every injury in which first aid is given, even if it's minor. And it should also be filled out for escalated behavior incidents um, in which the program director needs to intervene. So escalated behavior incidents include endangering self or others, bullying, elopement, um, repeated defiance, things like that. I know this was a lot of information and I thank you for taking the time to carefully pay attention and work to understand why we have a child protection policy what it is, and how you will be sure to adhere to the guidelines. If you have any questions, please contact the pastor, clerk of session, or the chair of the CE committee, and one of them will address any questions you have. Let's close in prayer. Lord, here we are. We have answered your call to serve, and so we ask your hand to be upon us. Guide us and give us discernment so that we may show your love to these who you have entrusted to our care. Place your hand of protection upon them and upon us. Lord, help us to lovingly and cheerfully serve to the glory of your kingdom. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again. Your first step of the Safe Sanctuaries training is complete, so you may move on to the second step and take your quiz.